Uh, hello, everybody. This is Chris McCahill with uh, State Smart Transportation Initiative. Uh, we're going to be starting in just a minute. I'm going to give uh, people a little more time to uh, join in if they're running a little late. All right, uh, let's get started. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, at this webinar on the Innovative DOT, a Handbook of Policy and Practice. Uh, I am Chris McHale with the State Smart Transportation Initiative. Um, uh, just a few housekeeping things I want to take care of right off the bat. Um, just so everybody knows, we'll be recording this webinar, and we'll be making it available on our website. Um, a little later. If you have any questions during the presentation, just type them in the chat box at the lower right or on the right side of your screen um, in the box that says chat um, on your control panel. If you don't see that box in your control panel, you may have to click the little orange button with the arrow um, up there and that should bring up your, um, your control panel and you should see that chat, chat box. Um, we'll take all those questions at the end. Um, so uh, before getting started, let me just introduce um, who we've got um, helping us out today in this webinar. Um, so as I said, I'm Chris McCahill, uh, a senior associate here with SSTI. Um, I had six years in trans as a transportation researcher at the School of Engineering at UConn before coming here, uh, and a little bit of time with the Congress for the New Urbanism in, in Chicago as a project manager on their project for transportation reform. Um, also joining us is Jean Conti. Uh, Jean has more than two years, two decades of experience in public service and private business management, including as the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation, Assistant Secretary for the Transportation Policy at USDOT, and Vice President of PBS&J, which is now Atkins. Uh, Jean served as the Secretary of North Carolina DOT from 2009 to 2013, where he directed sweeping reform of the agency. And he's now a vice president of the Conti Group, which offers business development consulting. Also joining us is Roger Millar. Uh, he's the vice president of Smart Growth America and director of its Leadership Institute, which provides technical assistance programs for state and local governments. Um, he's held leadership roles in public and private sectors, including as the director of the Office of Planning and Grants in Missoula, Montana, and uh, in the development of Portland, Oregon Streetcar and its Pearl District. Uh, he's a licensed professional engineer, a certified planner, a certified floodplain manager, and a fellow of the American Society for Civil Engineers and a member of its Committee for America's Infrastructure. <clears throat> so the Innovative DOT Handbook. Um, let me click here. This is, uh, so basically the Innovative DOT Handbook is a resource for state transportation officials. Um, it was developed in a partnership by Smart Growth America and the State Smart Transportation Transportation Initiative initially released in 2012, um, and we just released an update earlier this month. Um, so today we'll be um, looking a little bit at the general content of the manual, but mainly highlighting uh, new content since the manual's, uh, uh, the handbook's initial release, and um, some information about how it's been used in uh, related projects. Um, so a little background on SSTI for anybody not familiar with the group. Um, we are a group that works with a network of state departments of transportation, uh, promoting transportation practices that advance environmental sustainability and equitable economic development um, with a focus on governmental efficiency and, trans and transparency. Uh, we function in three ways. Um, one is a community of practice for the CEOs of state DOTs. Um, offering an opportunity for them to meet two or three times a year uh, and share ideas. 
We also offer direct technical assistance uh, to state DOTs, and we serve as a resource for the transportation community, providing um, reports and other publications like the Innovative DOT Handbook. And now I'm going to turn it over to Roger um, so he can introduce uh, Smart Growth America and uh, talk a little bit about how the Innovative DOT Handbook came to be. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where in the country you are. I'm Roger Millar with Smart Growth America. Uh, Smart Growth America is the only national organization that advocates for smart growth. Uh, we provide uh, advocacy. We provide policy development. We provide uh, technical assistance to communities um, and states around the country. Um, smart growth to us is strategies that uh, for urban, rural, and suburban communities that provide housing and transportation choices near jobs, shopping, and schools. So strategies are designed to support thriving local economies and protect the environment. Um, what I wanted to spend a couple of minutes with you um, today, waiting to get control of the screen here. Try clicking on the slide, Roger. I think you should be getting control. Click on the slide. Well, it's advanced. I don't know who advanced it, though. But anyway, let's talk about the Innovative DOT a Handbook of Policy and Practice. Um, the document is designed to provide practitioners with policies that excuse me for just a second while we go back. Strategies that states can use to achieve the greatest outcomes for the least cost with transportation investments that they make. Uh, we've pointed out innovative approaches that state leaders are already using around the country to make systems more efficient, make government more effective, and to better satisfy their constituents. The handbook is a compendium of 34 policies and practices we gather from around the country from folks that we work with. Uh, it goes into detail. What's nice about it is it, it talks about the benefits of the policy. If you implement this policy, here's what's going to happen in your community or in your state, what's likely to happen. It talks about the specific steps that a DOT would need to take to implement the policy. And then it provides you with case studies of where similar policies have been implemented elsewhere, which is great to have when you're, you're looking to innovate. It's nice to be on the leading edge, maybe not on the bleeding edge of what's going on around the country. And it also provides resources for further information if you're interested in engaging and making some of this stuff happen. Um, you get an idea of where you can, uh, where you can find uh, the information that might be of help to you. Just uh, click the slide once, Roger, and you should have control. I did. There's a slight delay between clicking and the change, but you sh there you go. Okay, it's quite a delay, but we'll do we'll it. So anyway, what the innovative DOT adds, I mean, there, all this stuff, a lot of it is, is already out there. Uh, people are doing great stuff. But what we've done is we've pulled it all together into one place. So you have all these innovative strategies in place. And you also have a, a menu, if you will, for a full program of smart transportation initiatives, ideas that uh, you can take in your state and, and use to uh, affect change. Um, it does bridge the gap. Um, a lot of people are talking about high-level policy goals in terms of innovative project selection or innovative funding strategies or linking land use and transportation. There's a lot of talk about that. What we do is we take those high-level policy goals and we drill down into the concrete strategies that you need to have to, to make them operational in your, in your community. The handbook was developed, uh, as Chris indicated earlier, by a partnership between Smart Growth America and SSTI. Uh, the project team included professionals from both organizations, 
We also contracted with Nelson Nygaard and Kittleson and Associates and Spitfire Strategies to provide us with uh, technical support and communication support. We also wanted to make sure that we ran the form of this and the content of this by uh, people who had been in the chair. Um, uh, we put an advisory committee of experts together. Uh, Al Beeler, the former secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, shared that group. And then Paul Morris and Tok Samushakin and Lynn Peterson, uh, great folks who have worked in DOTs uh, around the country. Uh, Lynn is listed here at the time. She was with Governor John Kitzhaber in Oregon. She's now the secretary of the Washington DOT. But those are the folks who reviewed how we were presenting the information and the content. We also had great support from the Michigan DOT, the Pennsylvania DOT, the Arizona DOT, and others as we, uh, as we put the handbook together. We updated the handbook recently in 2014. Uh, new contributors, uh, former Secretary Gene Conti, who will be on the presentation in a few moments, uh, Matt Garrett from ODOT, folks from Wisconsin and Michigan, Illinois, all over the country providing us with the benefit of their experience and their expertise. And the handbook brings that, that experience and expertise, uh, puts it in your hands. So what we did for the update in 2014 is, you know, since we published it originally in 2012, we've continued to work with state DOTs around the country. So we've operationalized new strategies. We've been tracking innovation and uh, and seeing what's going on. And we wanted to bring that all back to the handbook and give you the freshest possible resource. So since the handbook's initial release, uh, DOTs have been working on new funding strategies around the country. They've been bolstering their planning efforts in response to MAP 21, in response to state and local initiatives and the interests of their constituency. They've been making better use of their existing infrastructure. We've been looking at you know, how do we get the maximum out of what we've built in terms of operating it effectively. And new design standards and project delivery procedures have been put into place around the country. So the 2014 edition of the handbook reflects all of those changes. We've added three new strategies for reform. We've put 20 new case studies into the handbook. And then we've made numerous updates. You know, the, It is a dynamic thing. And when we put a handbook together and it's got links to websites and stuff like that, those need to be updated on a regular basis. So the, uh, the 2014 handbook update did a refresh on all of that. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris now to talk about uh, what's in the, uh, the handbook. Um, so Chris, back to you. All right, thanks, Roger. I think I skipped ahead here. So um, first is to talk a little bit about the uh, criteria for including strategies and case studies in the handbook. Um, and this is the same criteria that was set out from the very beginning. We just made sure we adhered to it in doing the update. And really, um, these policies and strategies aren't isolated to any one aspect of the function of an agency, um, such as simply planning or simply project delivery or internal policies or anything like that. Um, instead, uh, we looked at any any sort of um, strategies that agencies are are implementing, um, but they they're all tied by a common theme, in that they are um, geared towards making smart transportation investments um, and facing the current realities of funding that uh, a lot of uh, DOTs and the US DOT are facing. So some of the key principles behind this approach um, are improved access and travel choices for users in the state, um, supporting more prosperous states and regions, preserving infrastructure, as Roger just mentioned, reducing environmental impacts from transportation, building healthier communities, and uh, of course, supporting uh, transparent and accessible governance. Um, so the handbook is uh, divided into eight focus areas. Um, and as you can see, they cover a range of topics from uh, revenue and project allocation to road pricing, um, transportation system efficiency, mobility and access, efficient freight, uh, transportation and land use integration, um, and DOT processes. Um, so under these eight focus areas, we've identified 34 strategies that are located each within these focus areas. And the handbook isn't intended to be read through from cover to cover. 
Uh, instead, users can start at any focus area that's of interest to them um, and see uh, what strategies that offers and then hop around throughout the handbook. And there's a good deal of overlap and uh, common themes throughout the book, so it's very easy to jump around among topics. Um, and in some cases, the handbook points to other relevant areas. Um, so it's definitely not um, intended to try to incorporate everything at once, but instead um, start at one point, start with the low-hanging fruit, um, and then build up from there, depending on um, what each agency is facing. So as uh, Roger already touched on, there is um, a lot of new content in the 2014 edition. I just wanted to show um, briefly exactly what that the new content is. Um, so you see here it was um, a dozen uh, individual new case studies that we've added in existing uh, strategies that were in the 2012 edition. Um, and as, as I mentioned, these cover a range of topics. And some of them are especially timely. Uh, so we've been um, diligent about staying on track of new trends. For example, level of service reform in California uh, was a key step that the state took um, through a state bill um, just towards the tail end last year. Um, other issues have been on, ongoing for the fa past few years. Um, for example, practical design and contact sensitive solutions in Tennessee, and I think Roger will be touching later on some of the work that uh, that we and, and they have that and Smart Growth America have been doing with Tennessee um, just in the past year or two. We've also added some um, updates to uh, existing case studies that were in the manual. For example, Oregon's road user fee um, has gone through some changes since the initial handbook was released. Uh, Chicago's Create program has seen some new progress that's focused on rail efficiency. Um, Massachusetts pay-as-you-drive program has advanced a bit. And we uh, updated some existing strategies with new best practices that have emerged since the first handbook. Um, so there's new content in the area of transportation demand management, specifically new revelations in active traffic management, um, system management, um, and freight, urban freight management, um, and much more new content. So rather than spending too much time on um, the overarching handbook, I wanted to focus on uh, three new strategies that we introduced in the 2014 edition. The first one uh, focuses on climate change resilience. I think since the first release of the Innovative DOT uh, in 2012, we've seen some steps, some, some states really begin to uh, tar start taking uh, a serious look at the potential consequences of climate change. Um, so there's been some pilot projects put into place, and uh, implementation, implementation plans are underway in a few states. The uh, case studies included in the handbook look at Washington and California. Both of these states have started to identify, identify flood-prone pr areas um, and then incorporate that flooding into maintenance and operations plans. So starting to understand um, how increased flooding will affect their maintenance routines for pavement, uh, and other infrastructure, and how flooding events will affect their operations planning and how to plan around uh, operations disruptions. Uh, of course, flooding is an issue in all coastal states um, and in the Midwest. Um, and as we know recently, this has had major implications for transit operations in the Northeast. Um, so these are all reasons that um, states all over the country are beginning to um, incorporate this into their planning. Of course, there are other issues, um, effects of increased weather events and increased heat and drought, uh, changing freeze-thaw cycles and um, related implications to energy use and how that's affecting the transportation system. So these are all areas um, where innovative DOTs can, can take a look at reforming their policies and incorporating these new plans. <clears throat> Another new strategy that's introduced looks specifically at design policies and standards. Um, and while the uh, initial um, release of the handbook did take a look at uh, design policies. Um, this is really talking about the design standards um, that are in place um, that dictate the outcomes on projects. Um, this is about recognizing that highway design standards that are very common in DOTs are really just that. They're for highways, and they're not always appropriate in all contexts. So state agencies are increasingly finding themselves um, having to work in urban areas. And that's, just, that's not just big cities, but it's also towns and villages um, where state routes are often the main artery or sometimes serve as a community's main street. 
and that community might be interested in um, retrofitting its streets for multiple users or implementing a complete streets policies. Um, and in those instances, the, the agency's design standards play a key role. So in these cases, agencies need to look at um, new policies that are sensitive to the context along the road. Uh, they're multimodal um, and designs that are appropriate in low-speed environments, um, which is sometimes new terrain for DOTs. Um, and they also need to learn to rely on the street network capacity and connectivity for meeting its mobility needs. Um, there are some examples of, of these types of guidelines that you may be familiar with, such as two design guidelines recently released by NACTO, uh, or the Designing Walkable Urban Thoroughfares Recommended Practice from ITE. Uh, however, it's more common for agencies to rewrite their existing policies or write their own new policies than it is for them to um, adopt those uh, policies from other sources. Uh, so in the um, handbook, we've outlined a few case studies of states that have done just that, um, written new policies and standards for urban design. Uh, new Jersey worked with Pennsylvania DOT to release the Smart Transportation Guidebook a few years back, um, and it's also released a few complete streets guides that tackle many of these issues um, around urban design ranging from planning of, of such projects to the actual design. Uh, Massachusetts DOT in 2006 rewrote its entire design guidelines uh, with a greater focus on safety and mobility for all users. Uh, so this uh, introduced a lot more flexibility into the existing design standards, um, allowed engineers to work um, in uh, more confined areas and at lower speeds. Um, and it integrated the uh, accommodations for multiple users into the entire design process from beginning to end. Also, Florida DOT uh, wrote a new chapter um, in its guidebook uh, in the past year or two, uh, focused ex explicitly on traditional neighborhood development. And the picture shown here is from the uh, Florida DOT guidelines. So this is the type of environment that they're preparing to work in. And finally, the third new strategy that we've introduced in 2014 um, focuses on agency organization and cultural change. So this is firstly about recognizing that the mission of most DOTs is different than it was a few decades ago. Uh, DOTs began as highway design agencies funded primarily by fuel taxes, um, but now they're increasingly becoming multimodal and interested in sustainability, and they're becoming publicly engaged, and they're learning to do more with less. So secondly, this is about taking the steps needed to fully implement and integrate many of the strategies outlined in the handbook. So this is really about tying it all together um, and, and making it uh, fully functioning within the agency. Uh, we've outlined some key components that it takes to do this successfully based on experiences in some of the states. Uh, it takes a clear vision and strong leadership. Um, it often means setting new goals and performance measures. It means changing the way day-to-day -day business happens building human capital and planning strategically, and taking new approaches to communicating and sharing information with the public and internally. <clears throat> so in the handbook, we look at a few case studies of uh, places where this has um, began, begun to play out. Um, and in each case, it's, there's a different uh, strategy or a different mechanism or a different impetus for, uh, for instituting cultural change within the agency. Um, in North Carolina, this looked a lot at strategic planning and goal setting. Uh, it was a very data-driven approach. Similar to Missouri, uh, where they instituted a performance management plan, also data-driven and performance-oriented. And um, in states like Minnesota and Illinois, this has kind of played its, played its way out in, in terms of multimodal planning and programming within the agency. Um, and the picture shown here is from Illinois DOT. Uh, it's a workshop that was hosted by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and the Congress for the New Urbanism, and it drew 30 Illinois DOT engineers from five different districts at the re recommendation of the secretary. Uh, and the purpose was to work with outside stakeholders to think about new approaches to road design. So these are the types of things that you see uh, occurring in these places through the process of cultural change. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gene Conti, who's going to talk a bit about um, how he's been applying the manual uh, in a training type setting. Um, and I think I may have to control the slides for him, but I think Gene, are you joining us? 
Great. Yeah, I, I'll I'll, uh, I'll change the slides for you. Okay. Thank you, um, and I appreciate the chance to be with you. I'm actually sitting in a car in California. It's pretty amazing what technology can do. Uh, so the first slide talks about these AASHTO transportation management conferences, which I have been involved in for about the last eight years, I guess. Um, it's a program that actually goes back 40 or 50 years at AASHTO, but it's directed to train and expose mid-level and senior state DOT managers to management principles, but also what's going on in the transportation world that they ought to be aware of and, and know about. Uh, it's held four times a year at locations around the U.S., so we try to accommodate attendees from across the country. Last year we did Madison, Tucson, Annapolis, and Atlanta. And occasionally we'll have somebody from Federal Highways or Federal Transit or somebody from a local transportation agency. Actually, this year I've been doing some work in California with SSTI and uh, managed to attract somebody from the Port of Long Beach. So it's kind of exciting to get a broader range of people than just senior DOT people, but we think um, we offer a good program. It takes about four days um, on site, and then we're available for follow-up if necessary. But I think it really gives people an intensive exposure to both the management principles and Dr. Bill Smidley, who's a recognized management guru, I guess you'd call him. Uh, he's come up through the ranks of Phil Crosby and some of the old management gurus from the 80s and 90s. He uh, does a, a lot of the program just on basic management principles, team building, that kind of thing. My particular area of focus is ethics, policy making, and performance management, so I do all that in one of the four days. And then Tom Berry, my former colleague, both in the private sector and as Secretary of Florida DOT, he does major issues in transportation, project management, customer satisfaction, those kinds of issues. And he does about a half a day on uh, Monday and about a half a day on Tuesday, and then I come in and do most of Wednesday. Bill Schmidtley fix fills in from Sunday through Thursday. So my policy making uh, pr uh, presentation really focuses on five principles, which we came up with when I served in the Clinton administration. You know, you could come up with a different set of principles. It's not really these are the only principles that would ever work. It's just the five we came up with after doing. Gene, we're having trouble hearing you. Okay. Uh, there we go. You're back. Okay. You're back. Uh, so the first principle I talk about is holism, embracing a broad view of transportation as a system. And that is different, I think, than a lot of people think about it or have thought about it traditionally. Uh, again, it plays right into a lot of the other themes in the Innovative DOT book. Setting and achieving comprehensive goals for transportation investments, not just building highway project by highway project one at a time and kind of piecing it all together somehow. Um, investing in system management, so making investments across the board. And again, these go back, these particular two bullets go back to particular sections of the Innovative DOT handbook and are very useful for me in terms of demonstrating what I mean by a holistic approach to transportation. And I think it gives the case studies give people a chance to really look at those cases and say, oh, I see what they're talking about and how, how this could apply in my state. Collaborative is another principle that we talk about a lot, including a broad range of stakeholders and agencies. Again, the book talks about coordination across agencies and it talks about improved freight coordination. If you look at that CREATE project in Illinois, for example, that was a real system bottleneck, but it involves so many partners and so many 
players and so many contentious parties, it was almost impossible to think about how to unravel it. It's kind of like a bowl of spaghetti you're trying to unravel and sort of put back together and make things flow a lot better. So collaboration is absolutely part of our transportation toolbox these days. And these case studies in the Innovative DOT help focus people's attention on how to do it, what other people have done, and how to be successful at it. You can switch it now. Third principle is flexibility and adaptability, openness to change. Um, I'm a pretty big guy. When I teach this course, I say it's not, nimbleness is not the immediate adjective that might come to mind looking at me, but I think it's more nimbleness and flexibility of what's inside your head. Um, so practical design and context-sensitive solution, being very sensitive to what's going on already in the system and how any improvements need to be done in a way that reflects that context and are, is very practical in terms of implementation. Removing barriers to off-system investment. You know, we have a, a sort of philosophy in this country about transportation is if the FAA puts money into it, it's the FAAs. If the Federal Highways does it, it's Federal Highways. If FDA does it, it's transit. And the railroad, same thing. Everybody's very protective of their investments, but at the end of the day, that doesn't really help make the system work for the customers. So in, in many cases, it's very helpful to look at what are the barriers to off-system investment that would improve the functioning of all those investments in a particular area where you have a lot of intermodal activity and how to figure out how to make those investments in a sensible way. Transparency. I say here, the innovative DOT is an exercise in transparency itself. It's just laying it all out there, educating people about what's going on, how to do it. You know, there's no mysteries anymore. There's no putting together a transportation improvement program that's kind of like this black box and you're not sure why things get in there or what they are when they're in there and how they come out. This is not the way we operate today in DOT, in a modern DOT. We operate in a very public manner, in a very open manner, and we get a lot of input and we get a lot of response and we have to react to a lot of different stakeholders, but that's what it's all about. We're much better off at the end when we're actually building stuff that people want and understand. Innovation, again, staying on that cutting edge. Next generation user fees, pay as you drive, a great example of two ideas in the book that will help us move to the next generation of transportation funding and mechanisms. And then mechanisms for funding non-roadway transportation. That's an area where we're always challenged to how do we get the right level of support for transit, for rail, for bike pad, for anything other than non-highway. And the highway program is actually struggling with this too now, right? user fees aren't working the way they used to. The gas tax is not as stable and predictable. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we need to always look for innovative funding mechanisms for all forms of transportation. Next slide is going to talk about performance management. And I want to emphasize that it's performance management because we've been measuring stuff for a long time in transportation. and. Some people do it better than others, and some people do a great job. If you look at the Washington State Gray Book, it's an amazing compendium of all kinds of measurements and facts about what they're doing. I think in some cases we do information overload, particularly for the general public. So really the emphasis here is on performance and outcome-focused project selection. How do you understand the performance of the system, and then use that performance data to help you make decisions about your next set of investments across the board. Again, looking at it from a systems perspective, including transit, highways, rails, whatever you need to to make sure that you're making those decisions based on good data and based on sound decision making. And in, and in fact, I think that all this leads to better decision making and better performance. And 
by demonstrating that improved performance, we can preserve and enhance our revenue base. Uh, I think there's plenty of examples in this book and plenty of examples I know of from around the country where you've got to make the case. You've got to show people the facts. It's not that hard, but we always haven't done a good job at it. But gathering the data, putting it in a, in a sort of form that people can get in a public forum, showing them how these particular investments will change the level of performance in a positive way for their lives, make their commutes shorter, whatever it is, make their children safer going to school. I mean, whatever it is, we've got to demonstrate that performance matters and we care about it and we can show performance improvement by the nature of the investments we're making. And I think that's the last slide for me. Thank you. So now um, that kind of wraps up the, uh, the content of the Innovative DOD Innovative Handbook um, <laughs> and uh, gives us some idea of how, how the uh, principles apply. Uh, what I want to do now is go through um, some of the, the project, projects that have been going on through SSTI uh, and Smart Growth America, which are really um, taking the uh, exact same principles that are outlined in the handbook um, and making them a reality, um, testing them, trying them. Um, and a lot of the uh, case studies in the handbook are the result of work like this. So the first uh, example I wanted to talk about was SSTI's work with the Delaware DOT. Um, we worked with the agency to develop a parcel level modeling tool for scenario planning uh, called LUTSAM. Um, so basically what this is is a way for uh, an agency to test out different development scenarios, different patterns of, patterns of development in terms of residential, uh, residential development, industry, commercial, um, and actually lay those out um, on the land and uh, see what the impacts of those different development scenarios play out for the transportation system, for environmental impacts, um, and anything else the agency is interested in. So this, this program runs in GIS with a user-friendly graphical user interface. Um, so it's pretty uh, easy to use and easy to plug into existing, uh, existing software that an, ag an agency may be using. The output uh, is a 3D visualization of the development patterns, as you can see uh, on the slide here. Uh, and the output can also be plugged into a travel demand model so that uh, an agency can evaluate the travel impacts um, and see how different development patterns will influence those uh, travel behaviors and um, other outputs. Um, so we, uh, uh, Delaware DOT ran a case study um, looking at different scenarios for development. And they found that urban development patterns could uh, achieve more than a 30% reduction in vehicle hours of travel, vehicle miles of travel, and delay compared to a suburban development pattern. So this has kind of enabled um, a shifting priority within the, within the agency and um, given some motivation for focusing more on integrating land use with transportation decisions. Um, and also Maryland DOT, I know staff at Maryland DRT uh, have shown some interest in using the tool too, um, so it has a lot more broad application. Another project um, that SSTI has been working on and is actually just wrapping up as we speak uh, is work with uh, Caltrans. Um, SSTI conducted an internal review of the agency uh, based on more than uh, inter interviews with more than 100 agency staff and other stakeholders. So the impetus for this work was, was primarily the uh, establishment of the California State Transportation Agency um, which is a, a, a new agency in the state, um, and kind of considering that an opportunity to, to reevaluate Caltrans and um, modernize the agency. Uh, in this review, some of the key challenges that Caltrans is facing became clear, uh, primarily um, one of them being that decisions about funding are, have increasingly been put into the hands of uh, local, um, local agencies. Um, so, Many of the, the smaller agencies are, are making decisions about where money should go, and then Caltrans being um, left with the responsibility of maintaining uh, that infrastructure um, and that transportation system. So sort of a shift in balance that's taken place in the state. Um, and then also the demands and expectations have changed dramatically since the interstate era. 
Um, as we talked about earlier, um, agent, uh, DOTs are no longer charged with all the same responsibilities they initially were. Um, they have to look more at planning and operations and maintenance than they used to um, in the past. So it's understanding um, where Caltrans stands on these issues and what's needed to, uh, to really address these problems and become a, a, a modern agency. Uh, and actually, the recommendations from the study are scheduled for release tomorrow. So uh, I can't go into it much more than that, but keep your eyes open for, for those findings. They're very interesting. And now I'm going to turn over to Roger, who's going to talk about a handful of projects uh, that um, Smart Growth America has been working on with local agencies. Great. Thanks, Chris. And the, uh, the projects that I'm going to be talking about are projects that have been included in the handbook as case studies, and they're examples, I think, on the ground that you can take back to somebody and say, yes, you really can make a difference. Um, in Oregon, we worked with uh, Director Garrett and the folks at the Oregon DOT on identifying non-roadway transportation funding options. They um, are constitutionally restricted to spend their gas tax, their state gas tax, on roads and bridges. So the idea was to identify dedicated sources of funding for everything else. And working with a huge group of stakeholders, everybody from the AAA and the truckers to the Sierra Club and 1,000 Friends of Oregon, we studied a bunch of funding sources and actually came up with 12 consensus funding sources and four consensus financing measures that we're taking to the legislature and things are beginning to happen. In fact, they dedicated uh, uh, lottery funding towards bicycle and pedestrian improvements in the last session. We're expecting more to happen um, in future sessions. But the uh, the review of the 60 funding sources is a part of the study we did and a, a great resource to DOTs around the country. Here comes Tennessee. Uh, we worked with uh, Commissioner Schroer and the Tennessee Department of Transportation the same thing, uh, working with stakeholders from all over the state, very different perspectives. Uh, the commissioner's problem when he came on board is that the department over time had built up about $9 billion in commitments with only a billion dollars to spend to make those commitments a reality. So they needed to do something differently. And uh, we came up with a way to develop new metrics to measure and prioritize all of their projects against broad goals and then a program to audit their current project list. Uh, they call it expedited project delivery. We've been calling it right sizing, what have you. What we found is back in the day when money wasn't as much of an object, uh, DOTs would say, does this project meet the objective or not? And if it didn't meet the objective, it was discarded. Even if it met 95% of the project's objective, at a fraction of the cost. You know, you're trying to save 10 minutes across town. If a project saves nine and a half minutes, it's a failure, but it saves nine and a half minutes for a dollar versus having to spend $100 to get that extra 30 seconds. We um, work with the DOT on developing this right sizing idea. They've implemented it, and the first five projects that they looked at had an original project cost total of $180 million. After doing the expedited project delivery review, they were able to deliver much the same program for $9.2 million, a savings of $171 million. So obviously, uh, there were some opportunities there. Moving on uh, to Michigan, we've been working with the Michigan Department of Transportation on putting uh, demand management strategies and mobility management strategies into place in big cities and smaller cities and rural areas around the, around the state. Uh, there is a uh, state of the practice on TDM that's on our website. There's a state of the practice on mobility management. And then a uh, leading livability pilot project report that talks about what we've done in communities around the, around the state in regards to mobility management and improving access. In Minnesota, we worked with the DOT. They had a, a funding gap. When they put their state highway improvement program, MinShip, into place, they had uh, $18 billion to spend over the next 20 years. But to meet their performance objectives, they needed an additional $12 billion. And they were having a hard time explaining that need to their constituents, particularly their constituents at the state legislature. So we came in and developed a methodology for them to assess return on investment. And they found 
uh, through our process that a $5 billion investment over 20 years, which is what they had identified as being needed to maintain the current performance of their system, was going to deliver between 10 and $23 billion in benefits to the taxpayers of the state of Minnesota. So that's an ROI of 3.1 to 1, which is a great story to tell when you're asking people for additional resources. They also wanted to invest an additional $7 billion, or they were proposing that investment over 20 years. And that $7 billion investment, we found, would deliver between 15 to $19 billion in benefit to Minnesotans, which, again, is a, a, a great story to tell and a great model for other states to use. In Vermont, Vermont has a smart growth law, and uh, the transportation agency wanted to see its policies and programs reviewed against that smart growth law to see the extent to which um, their investments were strengthening the state's economy, uh, protecting its environment, and, uh, and meeting the goals the state legislature set, had set. We found that they were essentially doing that, but we did uh, provide some ideas for expanding how they do corridor management, revising their design standards, improving their review processes, and documenting and measuring the benefits and costs of their programs, because we tend as, as humans to measure what we think is important to us, and uh, that's what they've started to do in Vermont. And, and last but not least, um, in Michigan and now in Vermont as well, we're doing a project that's uh, in the culture change range called Multimodal Development and Delivery, or M2D2. We've created within the DOTs a, a team of internal stakeholders that we're providing a state of the practice understanding of the multimodal environment. We're training them on active transportation, public transportation, ITS, TDM, freight logistics, giving everybody a common vocabulary. And um, we're working with stakeholders within the DOTs. We're also working with their customers. And then we're using that team, that, that team with that common vocabulary and the motivation to audit the DOT's practices, standards, and guidance, and provide recommendations for modifications to those practices and standards and guidance. We're also developing an implementation plan for the agencies and a training program for staff at the agencies and a communications plan. So we're anticipating some really interesting stuff happening in Michigan and in Vermont. And if you know a DOT that could use uh, an M2D2 project, uh, please let me know. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. Thanks, Roger. So that um, concludes our wrap-up of the, the new innovative DOT handbook uh, and the new content and some of the work that's going on around it. Uh, now I'd like to invite um, everyone to help us improve it. Uh, as we've mentioned throughout the presentation, uh, the Innovative DOT is uh, intended to be a living document, and we do plan to continue updating it as we have uh, in this past round. And we're always welcoming uh, new comments, new uh, uh, topics for discussion, new strategies and case studies. Um, and you can send uh, those comments uh, either to Smart Growth America, to Roger, uh, or to us at SFTI, to our uh, managing director, Eric Sundquist, and the contact there on the slide for you. For more information about the handbook, you can visit either of our web pages. Um, if you visit uh, SSTI.us, uh, you can download the handbook um, and find more information about it. Uh, you can take a look at it, um, see how it's broken down into focus areas and strategies, um, and browse it that way. Uh, you can also uh, get the same information at smartgrowthamerica.org slash the innovative DOT as shown there. Um, also visit our website, um, and you can subscribe to our newsletter um, and follow us on Twitter to find out about uh, more events. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the supporters of this project, um, including the Rockefeller Foundation, who has been a generous supporter of the project from the beginning, um, and also the US DOT and Federal Highway. Um, I'd like to remind everybody about our next, or I'll hold on. Uh, first, I guess we'll take some questions. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my coworker Robbie, who's also a senior associate here at SSCI, is going to help me out with some of these questions we've been getting. Sure, thank you. Um, first, I did want to um, just mention, which I 
we said at the beginning, but in case people joined us later, uh, this presentation will be available on the SSTI website uh, probably within a couple of hours, but definitely by tomorrow. Uh, it'll be available at the same uh, address that you went to to register for the website to begin with, uh, to, for the webinar to begin with. And there'll be a link on the front page at ssti.us um, to, that, to that recording. So if you missed it, if you'd like to pass it on to someone else, you will be, have uh, the opportunity to uh, pass on the recording. So we did have a couple of questions, one of which was, uh, do any of the presenters have a one-pager, a brochure, or other concise resource that highlights the importance of using performance measures to rate and rank project applications? I'm not sure who might want to take that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start, and uh, Chris or Jean, you can chime in as well. I do not have a one-pager, but if you look in the handbook, uh, in the uh, the uh, section that talks about uh, allocation of funding, um, there are very concise uh, resources there. One of the things we didn't want to do was to write a phone book on each of these things, so they are intended to be user-friendly and something that you can, you can uh, excerpt and hand to somebody that doesn't have time to read a whole bunch of stuff, but um, I do not have a one-pager on that. Uh, I'll just echo some of what Roger said. Um, Anybody interested in any particular subject area, the, um, the content of the manual is broken down on the website, and you can download individual focus areas from, uh, from either of SSTI's website or Smart Growth America's website. So that might be also another way to, uh, to um, provide that information. And the, the handbook is um, heavily document, uh, heavily referenced. So um, as you're reading through, um, it, it, it'll also like, likely point you to other resources, and the back of each chapter has a list of resources. So that'd definitely be a good place to start. Okay, um, and I did want to remind people that if they do want to ask a question, they can type it into the chat box at the bottom. Uh, we do have some time for questions coming up. And I think uh, someone just wanted to know whether um, you've gotten very much feedback from DOTs and practitioners about the content of the handbook. We learned a little bit about what Jean is doing at some of the trainings um, in some of the states that Smart Growth America and SSTI have worked with, but overall, do you have a feeling of the kind of reception this is getting in DOTs around the country? Yeah, so um, I think the initial development of the handbook was mainly a, a big exercise in trying to reach around and, and package a whole lot of information into into a digestible format like, like it is. Um, but we did uh, reach out to um, our partner states and um, any, anybody uh, who was interested in this stuff to get some feedback um, as we were entering the update in 2014. And we did hear back from uh, from a a handful of DOTs who are familiar with the handbook um, and anxious to um, share with us some of the ideas um, that they've been working on, some of the new projects they've been implementing. So I think the handbook actually serves as a catalyst for um, for uh, sharing ideas, and, and some of the DOTs are definitely excited about about doing that. Do you have any? Um, and it looks like um, that's all the questions we're getting for now. Um, I have a question that um, either of our other panelists could handle. Is um, coming at this personally from a, a exercise in in sort of high level thinking. Um, I know a lot of agencies are going to come at this uh, from a very practical perspective on how to how to implement some of these ideas and where to even start. Um, so either Gene or Conti, uh, Gene or Roger, if you want want to speak to where is a good starting point for an agency that hasn't even begun to tackle uh, these issues? Well, I, in my mind, it starts with some leadership. I mean, and it doesn't mean that you have to get the top person, but 
if there's a group of leaders in the middle management or senior management or, you know, people need to kind of seize the time themselves and start the discussion. Because this handbook is there, it gives people something to look at, to see, to touch, to feel, to understand. So it's not like trying to sell something that, you know, you can't direct people to. So it's really just asserting leadership. If you're in a DOT or if you're in a local transportation agency and you see the need for change, speak up, you know, get people engaged. I, I think that's the best way to start. Obviously, if you get somebody at a secretary level or commissioner level or whatever, uh, wherever your state is or local government is in terms of if you can get somebody to push this from the top, that's great, but you can start from the middle or the bottom, too, if you get people who are willing to kind of stick their necks out a little bit and say, look, what we're doing is not getting the job done. We need to, we need to learn some new tools and develop some new methodologies. Yeah, I would, uh, I would echo what Gene said about people uh, stepping out, and that's what we're seeing around the country. The M2D2 work that we're doing with the Michigan DOT was suggested by a sponsors group of managers there, including two of their district engineers, Tony Credible and Paul Adjaba, Polly Kent at, at headquarters, Sharon Egger, who runs their public transportation group, uh, Mike Caps, who does their economic development work. They came to us with the idea of, of innovating you know, through this, this culture change project. The other thing I would point to people is in the, the front of the handbook is a note from Al Beeler. Al is the former secretary of PennDOT and former president of, of AASHTO. And he, he wrote a message on, you know, you know, congratulations or my condolences, you're the new CEO of the DOT. Now what? And it's a, a really good uh, piece of, uh, of writing about you know how to how to sip from this fire hose and with all these different ideas coming at you, how to effectively innovate within your organizations. I encourage you to give that a read. The other thing I'll add is this is not a short journey, folks. This is you know you got to be in it for the long haul. Um, it sometimes takes several years just to get the ball rolling, let alone complete anything. Yeah, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Well, thanks, both of you. I think that's a great place to wrap things up, and we're just coming up on an hour now. So uh, thank you both, again, very much for joining us, and thank, uh, thank you to everyone for coming and learning a little bit more about the Innovative DOT Handbook. I'll just remind everybody again, um, visit uh, our website at ssti.us, um, where you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on Twitter. Uh, we put out a newsletter every two weeks. Um, and also visit smartgrowthamerica.org. Um, our next webinar will be Rethinking the Urban Freeway, um, and that's going to be on February 20th at 1 p.m. Central.